Hi, welcome back to my channel. This is Shady Atia and today's presentation is about scientific contribution. The presentation of today is a follow-up on a previous presentation on novelty and it is part of a playlist on for master's thesis and PhD dissertation. Now we need to know that novelty means something that is unique in the field or scope of your research that you are looking to analyze and it can be a new methodology or a new theme that sets the stage for the new knowledge. Once we define novelty, we can start to define who is the audience of today's presentation. The audience of today's presentation is mainly researchers who are going to perform high quality research and they are seeking to define their research question. And in the same time, it can be catered also for researchers who are publishing and they have rejected papers. So that this can help them to understand why their paper get rejected, especially if they get the comment that the work is not novel enough. So in this sense, all author, authors with rejected papers or proposals due to the criteria of novelty can be benefit from this presentation. And through this presentation, I will try to answer the following question. Why did my research paper or my pro proposal get rejected due to the lack of novelty? So the objective of today's presentation is to help you to evaluate the scientific contribution, the added value and the novelty of your own research. And for sure, together, we will try to answer the following question how to assure the contribution of my research and how to assure that in my article or in my thesis or in my dissertation or my research proposal, I address novelty properly. The content of the presentation will focus on defining the aim of science and why we are doing science, the types of scientific contributions, how to position yourself regarding previous work and other competitive uh, uh, research teams that are working in the same research area and for sure using the famous innovation quad that I developed to help you to assess your own research and uh, evaluate the level of innovation before some takeaway message. So let's start the presentation with the aim of science. It's very important to use this added value quad chart because it can help you a lot to define what is the purpose of your research and where, how can you position it. Well, when you look at this graph, you can see that there are four quadrants and the most quadrant that we are focusing on here is this upper right quadrant where we are looking to advance science. But in reality, a lot of research we are doing is not advancing science. In reality, when we look at the four axes of this quadrant, we discover that top we will have socially useful science and down non-socially useful science. On the right, research that advances science and research that is not advancing science. So once we use this quadrant that is developed by uh, Sovacool, Axen and Sorrell in 2018, you can check their publication, you can figure out that there is a lot of research that is happening in this three quadrant that has nothing to do with advancing science. G let me give you an example. If you are working on theories with potential use, they are very abstract, they are not socially useful, then you are not advancing science. If you are working on biased research that is poorly designed, not validated, it is neither socially useful and neither advancing science, then you are far away from the quadrant top on the right. More dangerous, if you are doing research that is applied with a lot of commercial value, it is interesting to the society, it can not advance science as long it is not on the quadrant on the right side. So keep this into account when you are choosing a research topic, you need to ask yourself very, very seriously with rigor and involve peers and involve your promoter or involve other supervisor by making sure and asking yourself, is my research really advancing science or I'm doing applied research that is socially maybe very useful, but scientifically is not so advancing science. Am I only working on a theoretical research that is maybe relevant socially, but it is not advancing science? So these questions are all important and definitely need to avoid this uh, uh, lower left uh, quadrant, which is neither socially useful and neither advancing science. So the benefit here of using this quadrant that you ask yourself always, am I advancing science and am I working on a topic that is social, socially useful? Once you pin up your research in this quadrant, then you are in the right direction. Now, allow me to reiterate on what is re innovation or what is novelty. There is another word that is commonly word uh, that is used in the scientific world, which is the niche. What is a niche actually? It's a word that comes originally from French and it's a specialized corner of your scientific field where you have potential to conduct research and create important new knowledge for a significant period. 
And every researcher should find his or her niche in this sense that you try to figure out what is the area that you will excel in, you will be spearheading research in this area, and very little people are competing with you so that you make sure that you have a high leadership and you have a capacity to make an impact. So it's very important also to position this presentation that you build up your own niche, which is your specialized area of specialization. You have your special techniques, you have special themes you are working on, and from there you can have a, well, a good uh, career in research. Now, moving from advancing research to the second part of today's presentation, which is what are actually the types of scientific contribution? Can we classify them? Indeed, yes, we can. Well, we have three types of scientific contribution. The first one, we call it the theoretical contribution, which is novel research topics. We are talking here about themes that are new, concepts that are new, theories that are new, and you are working on these topics that are very knowledge, very novel, they are trendy, they are on the state of the art, uh, making a buzz in the world of science, and here could be a scientific contribution that you are tackling a topic that is very no novel or new. This could be one type. The second type of uh, scientific contribution is, could be methodological, meaning that you are working on a novel method, a technique, a way of doing things, and here you are describing the process, how you are doing this, and you can define it by having, uh, uh, or related to, by having a special device, a special technique of um, conducting a certain experiment, characterization, and so on. So this could be the second type of methodological uh, uh, second type of contribution, which is methodological. Also, when you look at it from another point of view, if you remember one of my famous slides I always use in my presentations, that if we classify research methods, there are actually four types of research methods. The modeling, the observational, the experimental, and the qualitative. And maybe you can say there's a fifth one, which is the mixed approach between the quantitative and the qualitative. But when you are looking at methodological contribution, it could be that you start to combine different methods together. So here we are talking about that the method itself is the carrier for uh, innovation and novelty. Let's move to the third type of contribution that is also very famous, which is empirical. Here we are talking about examples coming from reality, examples coming from case studies. Here we are looking at novel fields of observations. So you are analyzing what's happening in reality, you are distilling learned lessons, and you are sharing this knowledge with others. So this could be the third type of scientific contribution. Now I summarize these types of contribution here in this table, and actually what's the purpose of the table is that you define your own research according to this table, and you ask yourself, am I advancing science? Am I having a scientific contribution? And what is the type of my scientific contribution? So allow me to take you through this, this table with the three types of scientific contribution, and let's start with the first scientific contribution type, which is thematic and conceptual. This type of scientific contribution, when we look to evaluate the novelty and originality, it's mainly new theories or new discoveries. What is the common approach to be used? It is mainly meta-analysis or evidence-based results, and the significance of this thematic and conceptual contribution is that we are providing explanation of important and unknown phenomena and making sure that we can have an impact on society or on practice or on industry. Definitely an example for that could be having major thesis of several articles, for example, to discover the theory across a full range of applications, for example. Now, the second type of uh, contribution, which is methodological, here the novelty is judged by having a new method, a new technique. The approach is mainly a method or a process. And here the significance is looking at methods that provide a step change in progress in a discipline. So this could be an example of having methodological papers that demonstrate the utility or the significance of a specific uh, method. Now, the third and the last uh, type of uh, scientific contribution is the empirical one, and here it is mainly based on practice, and you need to be very careful because not every empirical research is evidence-based. So here we are looking at new discoveries, we are looking at new insights, and the approach is mainly case studies, the approach is mainly observation, looking at what's happening in practice. And therefore, if the practice is doing ill, there's ill practices in the observation I'm, I'm, I'm observing, I need to make sure that I'm not transferring or echoing something that is not properly uh, ideal. And here the significance is measured by having major consequences and impacts of the discipline. 
and the example could be having major synthesis of large data sets or new measurements. So this is the example for the empirical research. So keep in mind that those are the three types of uh, research contribution and it's very important when you discuss your contribution of your research to name or associate your research with one of those. Now let's move to the third part of today's presentation which is positioning. Well, what is positioning? Positioning is simply meaning comparing your work with the work that has been done by others and pointing out the things that your study does which was never done before. So actually you're trying to distinguish your work and highlight the importance of your work and showing why it is unique. But in order to show that you are unique or your work is distinguished, you need actually to understand very good what's happening around you and you need to understand the literature, the body of knowledge, the different evolution of technological advancement of your field so that you are able to defend your work and position it. And when you design your research, you need from the beginning to select topics that makes you outstanding and your topic really uh, unique. So here in the positioning, we are trying to justify and frame the novel contribution in regard to existing work and previous work. Now, when we do positioning, there's some certain procedures that we follow. First of all, we ask your, ourselves when we do the positioning, is my research topic really advancing science? Is it on an international level advancing science? Is it only a local research that I'm doing in my country and that's it? Or I'm really contributing on the international level and that this topic and the research question that I'm tackling, it was not answered internationally. So the first thing you have to do first is to ask yourself what is the research problem that you are trying to solve because you need to be very practical and you cannot come up with an idea that is out of the blue. You need to check first what is the problem that I'm trying through my research to, to, to solve. Then you need to ask yourself why is my topic important? Is it relevant? Do, do people care about this topic? Would it make an impact? Uh, do people have questions regarding this topic? Then you ask yourself, what is the key contribution? What is the added value of my uh, potential uh, um, research outcome? Could it lead to a breakthrough? So these are all important questions that you use in the, use in the beginning when you select and choose your research topic so that you, if the answer is positive, then you make sure this means that you are on the right track and to answer this question, you need a lot of experience, you need a lot of reading, you need to discussions, you need to contact and touch base with your research community, the conferences that you are at them, the journal that you find, your favorite journal, to make sure that really when you're going through this question, you are finding an answer. And now for those people who are publishing a lot and they get rejected, here they need also to look at why it is a priority for this particular journal to accept your paper. So also when you are designing a research design for a publication, you need also to define the novelty in the context of the journal to make sure that this novelty will be appreciated in a journal. Because don't forget, most journals, or not all journals, are subjective at the end. Any human judgment is subjective, which means that the editor could, could give a disc, desk reject or the reviewers will reject the work if they do not recognize this type of novelty. So it is your role to be flexible, to be open and to read through the journal's uh, literature to understand what type of novelty this community and this journal expects and appreciates. Otherwise, you will not find the recognition and the paper will be rejected. So it is your role as a researcher to well understand and articulate the innovation and associate it with the type of journal. Based on that, you can go to the step of knowledge gap definition and this triangle uh, developed by Holger Robert Meyer, I always use it in all introduction of research, whether it's a proposal or a um, thesis or a PhD dissertation or a scientific paper, that we start with identification of the problem domain, then we have a critical discussion of what has been done, and then we identify the knowledge gap that has not been bridged previously and not addressed properly, and then we start to define the objective of our study and right after that we must define the scientific contribution and the novelty of the work. So this is the best way to structure your introduction if you want to convince uh, and want to have a, a convincing narrative so that others understand actually what's the problem, what is unique about this problem, what are you trying to bridge as a gap and what is the objective of the work in a very specific way with parameters based on operationalization and what is the added value of this work. So by that you can follow this scheme. 
Now, when if you ask me literature review, how I will do it, simply the, uh, the ultimate aid of a review of a literature is to provide background information about phenomena uh, or problems that are using existing relevant and reliable or credible literature. So in this sense, this could be the, 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 the definition that will help you to understand and perform the literature review. There will be uh, always uh, questions in your mind uh, which you uh, try to resolve, for example, by reading, um, and in the end, you will still look for answers. If you still do not find these answers through reading in literature, then you can start to shape and define your research topic, because here, uh, these questions can start to trigger your curiosity and make sure that you are on the right track. As long as you don't find answers, this means you are on the right track. Also, have, uh, you have to ask yourself, did I read enough? Have you read enough? There is a possibility that you might have not read everything and that there may be some literature that you have missed somewhere or somehow. Therefore, the importance of attending a conference or talking with uh, well-known, uh, well-established uh, researchers in your field will make you accelerate the process of understanding what has been done and what was not done and to evaluate and judge your idea whether it is innovative it will have a scientific contribution or not and here comes the importance when you are doing a long-term research like a phd for example you need to know that from day one even after four days your topic will, after four years of research your topic or three years the topic will be relevant so these are all important questions i need to perform and i need to have a literature review robust literature review that helps me to sharpen the definition of my research now, when we look at literature, we need to understand that we need to connect and funnel. And connecting and funneling is very important. Connecting and funneling start by looking at the past research and trying to look at future research, how it could be, and then you define your new research area. Once you come up with this definition of the topics and the keywords and the research question that responds to a problem, then you are on the right track. And one of the best ways to make sure that you are successfully defining your research question is and defining your research uh, innovation element is to connect with existing researchers. Once you have a network of existing researchers and you have the ability to associate a research with the first or a family name of the authors and they know which are the labs conducting research, then you are really connecting and funneling. Connecting simply is that you associate uh, the research that has been done with humans and researchers worldwide and try to contact them, try to look at them, uh, find uh, a map and draw a map and know, okay, who are the most famous labs working on my topic? Who are the famous authors working on my topic? I need to know them, get closer to them, check them on ResearchGate, check them on LinkedIn, check them on Google Scholar, check their profile. Uh, you can subscribe to their publication list. So by that, you are getting closer to understand who is doing what from a human point of view. And on the other side, you look at what has been done historically, what could be done in the future, and you find, define yourself and define your new research as something between the past and the future. That's it with this part. Now I'm coming almost to the end and the last part. It's a very powerful tool that I developed and I advise you to use in order to judge your own research and make sure when somebody asks you what is the novelty, you are able to answer this question. Well, this is the innovation quab and I developed it. Uh, since uh, several years and as you can see I am reminding you that there are three types of contribution thematic conceptual methodological and empirical but how can we use this tool well this you this tool is very useful so that you define what is the level of innovation and novelty of your research according to this tool that I developed there is five level of novelty and innovation and with all researchers in my lab that I work with them I give them always this exercise and ask them to come back after studying this quad chart and I ask them, what is your level of contribution? And they come always with a number. And as you can see, this uh, quad chart is numbered. Actually, this quad chart is trying to answer the following question. What is the science behind your research? And it is advising all researchers to involve diligent inquiry and systematic observation of a phenomenon. So the first and the highest level of novelty and scientific contribution, which could be breakthrough, uh, achieving to, uh, uh, leading to breakthrough, is the, the, the new discoveries, the number one. Here we are looking at new discoveries, finding a causation, finding a pattern, finding or understanding a phenomena, 
And this type of research, it's considered universal science. As you can see, it is on the side of solutions and evidence. So it's evidence-based, solution-driven research that is looking at new discoveries. This is the most striking research that could advance science. This is the level one, and you need to ask yourself, is my research in this quadrant or not? The second level of innovation is the new methods and techniques uh, innovation. And here we are looking at technology, at processes, as, as procedures. And this type of research, it is driven by looking at solutions and looking at empirical, practical sides, application. Third level of innovation and novelty in order of importance and impact is the new creations. Here we are looking at new materials, new theories, new inventions, products, for example, processes, and so on. And these kind of new creations, they are on the side of evidence and on the side of solutions. This means that they are looking at evidence-based approaches, and this is the third level of innovation. The fourth level of innovation is the research that is seeking new understanding. And this is more, most of the time uh, empirical research with less focus on a solution and this type of research is more looking at understanding so as you can see it is mainly case studies or observation of real practices and the fifth and the last and the lowest level of innovation and novelty of research is number five which is local applied research if you do applied research in a local context in a local city or a local country while it is very relevant in that context but out of the context it is not contributing to science because it's lacking mainly the universal nature of science and it's lacking evidence or it's lacking the solution nature. So this diagram, you can use it from now on and I advise you to use it always to rank the research that you are doing. And especially if you are coming up with a new research paper, for example, and you are discussing its innovation, you can use this chart to define which level of innovation am I and based on that, you can expect what kind of journal you are going to publish in. So give me, I give you, I give, allow me to give you this example. As we all know, uh, journals are divided into four levels, the Q4 journal papers, the Q3, the Q1, and the Q, uh, Q2 and the Q1. The Q1s are the most important journals that are listed in the web of science. Uh, Q2 and 3 and 4 are listed, for example, in Scopus. And here we can see that the level of quality goes down and the citation goes more down. So let's start with the first level of journals. If I'm doing a Q4 journal, it could be Scopus listed, for example. In this sense, the journal will be having a peer reviewing system. It says adopting the best practices of scientific publication. Here you can do a significant scientific contribution and you are doing a individual work. You as an individual researcher, you are working alone on a topic and you have some new interesting finding. You can publish it in a Q4 journal, for example. However, if you want to Published in a Q3 journal, you need to have a higher level of work and quality. The research findings and the innovation level should not be only be significant, but even remarkable. And this means that you are moving from a 10% difference or change or improvement to a 30% improvement. And you still can do that in an individual way. You can work alone. Once you move to Q2 and you move to Q1, the work must be in teams because now we are looking at collective intelligence and a collective contribution and a collective novelty. And here the difference between, between Q2, we are talking here about striking resu uh, results, at least 50% improvements, for example, and groundbreaking research that can have uh, improvement of 100%. And these types of four rankings can be directly linked to my previous uh, innovation quad chart so that you can start to associate your work with this level of contribution. If you want to publish in a Q1 uh, journal, you must make sure that you are either in this quadrant of new discoveries, new methods, or new creations. It will be very difficult to publish in a Q1 journal if you are on the, on the level of four of innovation or level five. So you need to have a level one or two. Uh, in my opinion, level one is, is the best and so on, based on the level of innovation that you are working on, you can after decide where to go and then you will have easier acceptance rates. So it's important to take this in account. Now allow me to iterate on something else which is very important for PhD students. Well, PhD students suffer a lot with the problem of defining the research contribution and in this sense I have for you uh, this statistic that I've been collecting since years. 
about the most challenging problems that PhD students face when they are doing research. And as you can see, in the uh, early career researchers, the number one challenge is data collection and data availability. Meaning that if you are not going to define your research topic and the innovation and novelty of your research in direct connection to data av availability or data collection, then you are totally theoretical and you are unexperienced. You need to be professional by linking the novelty and the contribution of research to the data that you have and the quality of the data of the, you have. Most researchers endeavor the research with very theoretical and very ambitious dreams, looking at very highly innovative concepts. And when they get asked on a practical way, what is the data that you possess or the data that you will collect that will help you to perform your research and achieve this uh, novel uh, outcomes, they end up saying, we don't have data, we didn't think about data, we didn't know that you need to have data. Well, in reality, the best PhD is a PhD where the data set is already there before you start. So from day one, the data set is already there. If you are late, you will work on the first year uh, uh, processing your data set or collecting your data set. But definitely, if you are in year two uh, and you don't have a data set, I think then this is too late to have a good quality contributing research. So it's important to look at the scheme. Data collection is the most challenging aspect in association to conducting novel research. Then the identification of the research problem, which is 74% of uh, candidate, PhD candidates are uh, claiming or uh, complaining about. And then it comes the time constraint, lack of guidance from supervisors, lack of experience in selecting the research field, and lack of interest in the research topic. So you need to be very conscious. And my idea here, or my advice, is always check the availability of data in relation to the concept or the novel research contribution that you are seeking and for sure in integrate always the future. Make sure that you address the future nature, the futuristic nature, future scenarios in your research. I come, and to, I come to the end of today's presentation, some takeaway messages. Well, first of all, I advise you to read. So read similar journal papers and articles based on the keywords relevant to your research. Make sure that you read and skim in more, not more than five to 10 minutes similar work, which could be thesis, could be dissertation, journal paper, so that you can go through a large number of documents to check and go how far my topic and my idea is novel, it is contributing in regard to what has been done before. And once you have a tentative title for your research or a tentative research question, you can start to research it on Google, for example, or any research uh, engine that is specialized, PubMed, or Scopus or Web of Science to check using those keywords what are the publications that has been written in relation to this topic and then based on what you can find and based on reading what you find you can assess how far the idea is novel or not it has been done before the work or not and for sure we need to remind you I need to remind you here that the research question definition is the most difficult uh, part of uh, any research uh, design because it will have to be based on your assessment of the contribution and novelty of research and you need to formulate and crystallize a research question, prove the impact and the benefit of answering this question from a novelty and contribution point of view. You need to be very specific, very technical, using variable in your research question. You need to build a network of peers around your question to make sure that who will be joining you in this research endeavor, you are not alone. The more, like I showed you in the graph, the more you have a team and you have associates and you have partners uh, working with you, the higher the impact, the, 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 the breakthrough findings can be achieved. And for sure, test your question against reviewers and editors. You need always to test your uh, uh, question through uh, peers and bring your question to a deep level of added value. So don't think that the question will be uh, one round of iteration will be sufficient. You need several rounds, you need several inputs from others to make sure that the research question is really specific, unique, and it can lead to a breakthrough and innovation. Some final words. Scientific contribution is very important to do, be defined in your research. I advise you to use uh, the quad chart that I am uh, developed to assess your research and uh, classify it and level it. And once I come to my lab, I ask always my research, uh, research, uh, uh, researchers, 
when they come up with a new idea, what is the level of innovation? And based on that, we proceed. So you have to ask yourself always, did my research advance science or not? So to answer this question, you need to formulate and crystallize a research question. You need to prove that the impact and, uh, of your research is high and that there is a universal nature and scientific value of your work. You need to involve diligent inquiry and systematic observation of a specific phenomena to be able to consider your search in the class one, which is universal research uh, based on a solution and evidence. And you need also to distinguish evidence based from the, the empirical. As you can see, empirical research is a lower on the lower side of uh, research innovation. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it is on the uh, lower side because it's more on the understanding and it could be also on the side of applied research. So empirical research is not always the best uh, to look at from a novelty point of view. However, evidence-based research is the highest level of quality of in, uh, innovation. Be specific and technical and start with data collection from day one and think while you are developing your research question and developing or defining the innovation of your work is what is the data that I will use and how I will associate the data with my research. Build a network of peers around your research question and test them because one of the message that I try to cross today is that you understand in order to go up in this quadrant and to have quality or level one or two or three research, it's very difficult to do it alone. You need to align with and join big teams so that you have different uh, collective intelligences that are fusing together in order to have something that is advancing science. And for sure, you need to bring your question to a deep level of added value and use the innovation quad chart to test your idea and communicate your idea. Well, by that I end up today's presentation, which is part of a playlist for master's thesis and PhD dissertation. I hope you can find it useful. You can also use it if you have paper rejections, if you want to come up with better paper concept. And today's presentation was simply about how to define the scientific contribution of my research. Thank you very much for your attention.